tonight's a bit of a depressing night for me. I probably spent more time in the last year, three years fighting super tankers or jet fuel in the Fraser River than any, any other project in my career life of about 45 years. And uh, I, I feel pretty depressed tonight, but I promise I won't cry. And my wife cautioned me. She said, don't use that word bullshit and don't be mean and nasty about the politicians. So I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, generous to the politicians. I won't say anything nasty about Harper or Christy Clark or anybody. Actually, I lied. I probably will. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and put a little bit of coal into context, and I know this is a coal meeting, but guys, I think, and I think Doug Massey, in fact, if I could vote in an environment minister, I think Doug Massey would be at the front of my list, but uh, the whole estuary is going to hell in a hands basket, and it's being fueled by jet fuel and fossil fuel, and uh, we've got to wake up and do something about it. And uh, my prediction is Stephen Harper will never become an environmentalist. Christy Clark will greenwash everything if there's a job in it. And my last prediction is uh, the new bridge over the Fraser River will never be named the Doug Massey Bridge. <laughs> okay, next slide. <laughs> really, uh, what we're looking at in the Fraser River is an, it, it's really a remnant of what it used to be, the lower Fraser River and the estuary. And the first industrial era, and uh, I mean, I'll have to take a shot at Harold Steve's great-grandfather. Uh, uh, you know, we ran into a lot of diking, and there, the estuary really started to change in the, in the gold rush way back then. But by 1920, things started to slow down. We killed so many young men in World War I, we couldn't exploit the environment that well. Spanish flu hit us. We didn't have the money. A depression hit big time. So we basically had an interlude from 1920 to about World War II, and things didn't look too bad. Uh, the second industrial era hit big time after World War II and carried on until about 1975 and then we started to catch up with things and we were allowed to take a breath or two and things started to look a bit greener in our society. And I'll get into some of the things later on of what improved there, but it was everything from improved legislation, environmental assessments, uh, a, a bit of an awakening. And some of us old timers, and I'm an old timer now, and I just hate it when I look upon a room full of mainly old timers also. I, where's all the young blood here? Uh, they've got to be out here fighting with us. But uh, when I look back at the 1975 to about year 2010, uh, some of us now call that the golden era because uh, there was an environmentally awakening. Things did improve greatly, and then things really started going downhill in the last two years. And, uh, and some of us predicted that when we said certain governments would get into place in Victoria and certain governments would get into place in Ottawa. Yes, and it, it all did happen, unfortunately. Now, uh, the government in Victoria and the government in Ottawa has basically set us up for the third industrial era in the Fraser River. That started probably about two years ago, and we're just starting to see what those projects are going to be. Uh, there's just a shot of the uh, jet fuel terminal. I won't have any other, but this is what's proposed, and that was uh, approved today. And here you'll have up to 100,000 ton tankers coming up the Fraser River, super tankers, to put up to 80 million liters of fuel on the banks of the Fraser River. And we could have had a safe pipeline from the two refineries directly to the airport. Instead, we're going to go through this high-risk experiment, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're experimenting with the environment and our children's future and our great-grandchildren's future. Next slide, please. Prior to 1910, we, the impacts were dikes, training walls, channel maintenance, which is dredging mainly, and then Roberts Bank won in the 1968-69, and then they doubled it, and they called that Roberts Bank One. So I, and then they added a container port, so I call it Roberts Bank One plus One plus One, because now they're coming along with Roberts Bank Two, and really it's about Roberts Bank Four, really. Uh, tremendous industrialization of Lower Fraser, and a lot of effluents and sewage, and just a shot of uh, what the remnant part of the river looked like, with very little marsh left, very little mud flat, and all the land base largely uh, uh, filled in, and uh, houses or industrial area. We're dealing with a remnant of the estuary, and it appears as though, uh, if you're an environmentalist, just having 20% of the estuary left, well, I think you're being greedy, is what Robin Sylvester would say, or Harper. Uh, why can't industry have more of that last 20%? And that's what we're up against right now. So we have to relate to that fact. And I don't care if it's a coal port, a jet fuel port, expansion of Roberts Bank. Largely, it's the same thing. It just depends what they spill and what they put into the air. 
After 2010, well, Roberts Bank Terminal 2 came along, and we knew that was uh, brewing for many years. Uh, Surrey Coal Terminal, which is the cause of the meeting tonight. Jet Fuel Terminal, which was approved today. Uh, fourth Runway, they've talked about a need for a fourth runway in 20 to 40 years. That was several years ago, and they want to build that out in Sturgeon Bank, they proposed. And uh, uh, new bridges. Uh, and the stars have all lined up. Uh, we're going to have this new industrial era, and for some reason we've lost all our environmental legislation. I wonder why that happened. And suddenly there's this jobs, jobs, it's a blind agenda, of jobs, jobs, growth, and long-term prosperity, and to hell with the environment, and that's where we are. Next slide, please. However, uh, I'm accused sometimes of being doom and gloom, and uh, maybe I've been around uh, uh, Dr. Suzuki too long, I actually worked with him for four years, so I've got to give credit to some things that did improve over the years. We did get improved sewage treatment. We did, and some people like myself worked hard to get improved habitat protection legislation in the Fisheries Act. Well, that disappeared with Harper and Bill C-38 last year, so that gain w w only survived for a few decades. FRAMP, many of us got that into place in the 1980s. Uh, that was dissolved just uh, several months ago, so now that's gone. Uh, a lot of restoration work was done, but most of the money for restoration has now disappeared. And, uh, but another gain is we did lose quite a bit of dirty industry in the Fraser River and the North aren't being gentrified. Fortunately, it's a loss of jobs at times, but uh, some really dirty industries like coppers, uh, the creosoting plant, CIL plant, TPL industries, uh, they did disappear from the river. So those are improvements. So I know Finn Donnelly went uh, down the Fraser with him once in his swim, and he said when he did the swim, uh, uh, in the early 1990s, he said the north arm of the Fraser River actually tasted like creosote. And then when we went down the river in about the year 2000, 2001, he said actually he couldn't taste the creosote anymore. Well, most of these wood plants had been shut down and cleanups were in progress. So there were some improvements. Next slide, please. And I hope you looked at the last slide. It was better than this one of Robert's Bank. Uh, this one shows dirty water everywhere. That's because it's an it's a, uh, artist's drawing of what Robert's Bank will look like if Port Metro Vancouver gets their way. Get my pointer out here. They never work when you need them. I was right. Uh, and if you looked at the previous picture, you saw all the dirty water caught in here, the Fraser River. Well, that's where all the fish are caught as they come out of the river, too. And then they, uh, they can't get around to this part of the port. And this is what the uh, Fraser or the uh, Vancouver Port Authority wants to build a new island out there. And so even the fish will even be caught more so on the water, and it'll never get around to this far side. And I wouldn't be surprised the artist was told to make it all look like dirty water, so it appears as though the Fraser waters are distributing freely everywhere. Okay, let's just look at the, the non-coal issues for a minute, because we have to put it all in co-text. Jet fuel on the river, that's been approved. We're going to fight it like hell, and today we gave our lawyers, with the Vapor Group, authority to uh, start working on it. We're uh, barely started. We're $6,000 in debt already, so if you see a donation jar behind there, behind you, that'll help us a lot. Uh, we're looking at ways of challenge that agreement in BC Supreme Court, so uh, we're going to have to raise about $30,000 over the next month. Uh, tremendous traffic and barges, Panamax tankers. Can you imagine turning around a thousand foot tanker in the main stem of the Fraser River when you have maybe 1,200 coal barges going up and down the river every year? And uh, every time a coal barge goes down the river full of coal, it's got to come back up the, up the river empty. So you can double their uh, loaded coal barges or traffic. Same uh, Vancouver uh, Airport Fuel Facilities Corporation. Oh, they'll only have about 30 super tankers a year but they've got to go up and down the river, so you can say that's 60 uh, super tanker movements. So a uh, tremendous amount of traffic increase in the river. In the Strait of Georgia, you had 600 more tankers for Kinder Morgan coming to Burrard Inlet, and suddenly we've got a very busy waterway. Uh, you've got to give BC Ferries credit. They're the only company that's trying to reduce marine traffic in our waterways. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have spills and kills. Uh, the kills from coal dust won't be outright, those will be chronic. The kills and spills related to jet fuel will be very dramatic and uh, they'll be quite catastrophic. I visited Lemon Creek two months ago and three months after the spill up there, 33,000 litres jet fuel in the creek, 
The stream reeked of jet fuel when I was 100 feet away from the stream seal, and this was in cold, wet weather, and couldn't find a single invertebrate, a caddisfly, mayfly, living in under any rock in the stream. They were totally destroyed, and basically uh, 33,000 liters is pretty small in comparison to 1.7 billion liters. That's what's burned at the airport each year now. And that's what's going to have to come up the Fraser River. And the airport hopes to double uh, co this consumption of fuel due to uh, ever-increasing uh, expectation of a bigger and better airport as part of the Pacific Gateway. The jet fuel is toxic, flammable, explosive. There's a tremendous human safety risk. It's not just fish and birds that are at risk. It's a tremendous uh, uh, a problem, a threat to humans and property along the river. And I'm amazed how that hasn't been a bigger issue with a lot of people. When we start lumping some of these things together, there's going to be a massive habitat loss. You can't fill in that much more of Roberts Bank and not expect a massive habitat loss. Uh, tremendous flow, fish blockage, as I mentioned here, and a lot more noise, and it's going to impact whales. Next slide, please. The Roberts Bank existing uh, because it's in place already, and it has created a problem. So I would be one of the last people to say, take it all to Roberts Bank. Roberts Bank's made a hell of a mess of it already. Uh, it's cr constant ongoing spills, and, and people say, oh, well, the, the jet fuel barges will have a tugboat or two on them. Well, remember a few months ago when we knocked out a, 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 a walk cantilever, it had a tugboat attached to it, and it still knocked tons of coal into the port. Tremendous amount of lights and noise, and massive habitat loss, as I mentioned earlier, and tremendous impact on the estuary. And this is a remnant part of the estuary that's left, and it appears as though industry wants the last bit of it. How will Surrey Fraser, uh, Texada dock? Uh, tremendous noise for shipping with all those ships, and they plan to move barges out, tie them together, move them up the island, unload it, load it again. Tremendous amount of noise for the marine environment a great deal of dust, there will be spills, and uh, there, I think there's going to be an overall traffic problem. I was involved with many marine spills in the past, including Raid and Broad Inlet, where ships have run into each other, and this is going to happen eventually again, uh, pretending that now we have modern um, traffic methods to, to control traffic. We have double hull tankers, a lot of that. Whoops, I can't use a BS word, but the, I don't believe any of that because uh, Double hull tankers doesn't prevent spills at the port or when they're loading and unloading, things like that. So don't believe the impact studies that you often read. And there won't be any coal dust at Surrey Fraser docks. Uh, you've heard that. And they were going to have it under a building, and then people complained about that. Well, they're not even a pilot there anymore. It's going to come directly out of the train, directly into the barges. But if it's over 40 kilometer winds, there won't be any barges. So what does a train do? Sit in the middle of Bellingham, letting the coldest blow off into Bellingham, waiting for the wind to die down? Uh, don't believe, as mentioned uh, earlier, don't believe a lot of the material that's being fed to you about how this uh, Surrey Fraser dock's going to operate. Uh, a lot of it just doesn't make sense at all. And if you don't think there's dust, uh, at the coal rally in New Westminster, uh, October, uh, October in 2013, just a couple of months ago, I decided to take a picture of Surrey Fraser docks on that day in question. Uh, is that a picture of no dust at that dock? And there's no coal dust. And remember, coal is ground up. It's very fine. It doesn't settle out in water well. It gets in the air. It can fly a long ways. And it's very sharp particulate matter. It's the last thing you want to get into a fish gill or into your lungs. It just doesn't agree with sensitive lung or, or, or gill tissue. And here, incidentally, they're loading something that doesn't create dust. It's soybeans. Well, if soybeans is going to create dust, you can imagine how much more dust coal dust is going to create. Next slide, please. And here's some work. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues who did this work is in the crowd tonight. We're both ex-retired fisheries people. And this work it was done 40 years ago, if you can believe it. There hasn't been much done since. And with Stephen Harper in power, very little more of it will ever be done. But when, you, uh, uh, when DFO staff exposed uh, crab to uh, different concentrations of coal dust in Roberts Bank uh, sands, because that was one of my first projects looking at coal dust at Roberts Bank over 40 years ago. Uh, the crab were put in aquaria and the, stirred up constantly, and they were kept in there for 22 days. And this is what we call lamellae. It's really just, it's just the gill structure. That's basically gill tissue. I think my pointer probably works as well as anti-spill prevention mechanisms on barges and fuel terminals. 
Here's the gill lamellae, this is the gill tissue, and this is a space in between here that the water circulates through and the gills take out the oxygen. And what you don't want is a tremendous amount of irritable material in your gill or in your lung, and the last thing you want is sharp particulate matter. So this is crab gills on clean sand from Robert's Bank. Next slide, please. Here's 12% coal dust mixed into the sand, and you can see the sharp particulate matter and uh, the Fraser River is a dirty river. You can say, well, what's a little bit of coal dust? Well, the Fraser River has nice rounded particulate matter because it's flowed down the river for 100 miles or 1,200 kilometers, and it's rounded material, and it doesn't harm the gills that much. Whereas coal dust is very particular, it's been crushed up, and it hasn't had the alluvial forces to round it, and it's very, very nasty on the gills. And at 12% in this sand, you can see it's starting to stick on the edges of the gill structure. This is open water here, but you can see how it starts sticking and piling up in the uh, space that should be passing clean water through the gills. And one of the problems with our lungs or fish gills or crab gills is when something irritates them, it's it, 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 it uh, releases a mucus coating to protect itself. Well, with sediment coal, that's really a poor tactic to protect yourself because then the coal sticks to the mucus and your gills literally get clogged up or your lungs get clogged up. Next slide, please. We uh, Here, 50% uh, coal dust was added to the, uh, to the uh, testing apparatus, and it's pretty hard to figure out what is what. This is where the clean water is supposed to be in here, and you can see these gills of these poor crab is just plugged black, and the gills literally look black, and uh, this is the gill tissue. The clean spots are actually the tissue of the gills. So you can see what coal dust can do to a crab, and it can affect a lot of other organisms in the marine environment because they all breathe via gills, and uh, your lungs are probably as sensitive and not even more sensitive to coal dust, but uh, you're hopefully not going to live in 50% coal dust in your kitchen. Next slide, please. Summary impacts of coal dust. Habitat contamination, Harold mentioned that. There's no doubt about it. You're going to get it in the eelgrass beds all around the Roberts Bank Superport. There's many, many percent of coal dust in the marine bottom now. Some areas you have more coal dust than you have clean sand, and that's supposed to be a rich habitat area for raising young salmon, a nursery ground, bird life, and, uh, and that's where the young salmon also rear, and it's a big crabbing ground. Excessive traffic for birds, whales, fishermen, can you imagine when you get 2,000 boat movements up and down the river, 4,000 movements to the Fraser River, how many fishery openings you're going to have? And you look at the consultant report, and they says, oh, we'll, uh, we'll advise a fisherman when we have shipping in the river. Well, that's going to be 10 boats a day. When do you set out your net for an eight-hour opening? Spillage issues. Uh, studies have shown that uh, when you have coal dust in the sediment, uh, it affects their burrowing behavior. In fact, the more coal dust you have, the crabs just crawl under the coal dust and hide, and you can only see their eyes stick out for some reason. I don't know why. Whereas on clean sand, they come to the surface and they sit on the clean sand, I guess, where they, they, they can't be seen on the sand because it's a similar color, whereas they don't have the color of black coal dust, so they hide under the coal dust. It affects their breathing behavior, and as we've seen earlier, as we did see in the earlier slides, it very definitely affects their gills. However, it's a cumulative impact of jet fuel, coal dust, Roberts Bank II, new bridges, more traffic that has to be addressed. The consultants on the uh, coal project that we're meeting about tonight has said in their report, whoops, I typo there, the project's relative contribution to cumulative effects, e.g. Uh, vessel traffic, is insignificant, the Lavalin report of last month. And uh, this is where you could use expletives to dismiss much of that report, I think, whether it's human health or impacts on traffic. They say it'll, it'll only be 3% increase in traffic in the Fraser River. Well, I don't know if that's in one direction or if it's in both directions, so it's 6%. And uh, jet fuel people say, well, we're, we're going to affect only traffic by 1%. Well, if we could get rid of all of 3%, so 1%, so we'd have no traffic in the river at all. And uh, this approach is totally uh, unforgivable. It's sort of the old bologna analogy. You know, as long as you've got a big bologna sausage, you're happy, and you're willing to give away slice after slice because you've got a lot left. Well, soon you'll have nothing but the string left, and that's what the Port Commission's doing to the Lower Fraser River. They're trying to turn it into a Rotterdam. Next slide, please. Why all of this now? And this is a chance for your political comments and questions. We're in a recovery phase after the last recession, and it, damn it, we're going to get this economy going, and if it isn't running at 2 or 3% per year, we're absolute failures. 
jobs, growth, long-term economic prosperity, that could be in quote marks, that's our Stephen Harper agenda, and he used Bill C-38 to try and get, a, get rid of everything that was in the way of that agenda, and it's as though tar sands and everything else in Canada didn't prosper in the last 30 years when we did have a Fisheries Act and we had an Environmental Assessment Act, so you can see the government is quite ideological and almost trying to destroy concerns for public health and destroy all concerns for the environment, and that's truly unfortunate and it's unforgivable, and I'd say it's criminal as our grandchildren will judge later on. He's neutered all environmental laws and Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, He's removed habitat protection from the Fisheries Act, and Navigable Waters Protection Act now protects less than half of 1% of all waterways in Canada, and that was an important environmental protection tool. Then in Victoria, we've got the Jobs, Jobs, Economic Growth Agenda of Christy Clark, and as I've just been reading the Environmental Assessment uh, Executive Summary today, uh, basically, it's a greenwashing, and that's what I predicted Victoria would do. Of 120-some projects the BC Environmental Assessment Office has looked at, I think they only rejected two in the last 20 years, and I predicted that the jet fuel one would be a yet another one that they had greenwash and approve, and that's exactly what she says in her report. It's quite embarrassing. She mentions all the jobs, and this is an environmental assessment, environmental uh, certificate in it. She talks about all the jobs it'll create. And uh, that's more of a political statement, not an environmental review, but uh, I probably expected that. And then the real boogeyman in that dark closet is an out of control Port Metro Vancouver. They are pushing growth at any cost. They don't care if we lose our farmland. Robin Sylvester even said, Farmland is just a uh, emotional issue. It has no value, and yet if you look at television, uh, Port Metro Vancouver is bragging about how they bring in a million tons of food a year into the harbor. Well, if Robin Sylvester would do his damn homework, he'd appreciate we produce almost 1.5 million tons right in the lower Fraser Valley, and it's odd how he's willing to write that off and import food from overseas. So uh, it's an out of control port commission and it's in a conflict of interest. They're doing the environmental impact reviews as allowed by Stephen Harper, and there are the developers, basically the judge, jury, and prosecutor, and why are we allowing this in Canada at this time? Next slide, please. Have we forgotten our Fraser River's natural heritage? Most of you would say no, but I'd say a lot of people have. There's something really wrong out there, and uh, we well, can say, well, that's just the government. Well, one of the problems we have is 40% of the people can vote in a majority government, so we've got a problem with our electoral system, and that's what we have to work on. You just don't work on the environment. We've got to change the system that gets these people elected into office, but obviously not enough citizens care because, uh, as some people say, we get the government we deserve. I don't buy that one. I never have. But we still have, Fraser River is still the world's largest and most productive salmon stream. Why are we not protecting it now? Why are we giving it away in our third industrial revolution or evolution or whatever you want to call it? It still supports major fisheries for First Nations, some commercial fisheries when the salmon do come back. And if you're a fisherman, uh, you'd like to think I can do something else better for a living. It supports major recreational fisheries, and if you look at the report released today by Christy Clark, uh, there's uh, the Vancouver Airport Fuel Consortium has to compensate native fishermen for lost fish when there's a fuel spill in the river, but nothing is said of commercial fishermen or recreational fishermen, and I don't know how you're going to compensate for the bird loss, but uh, uh, that, that's, that's a problem with the governments we now have. It is a globally significant estuary. Probably if we go from Antarctic or the tip of South America all the way to Alaska, there's probably four important estuaries on the whole Pacific coast of North and South America, and the Fraser River is one of those four estuaries. Yukon, Copper River, Columbia, those are probably the four estuaries, and this is how we're treating our estuary. It is a key Pacific flyway. It's a resting and feeding area for our wildlife, and it's Canada's largest overwintering area for waterfowl. Uh, let's treat it a bit better. Next slide. Thank you.